Hey, good morning, friends. Hey, Brother Mike, back on the podcast. It's Sunday morning, 9 o'clock Mountain Time, 11 o'clock Eastern. And thank you for joining us. And I uh, want to share the deep things of God with you today. Uh, some very interesting stuff coming your way this morning. If you need to contact me, please remember you can uh, send me an email, mike at hardcorechristianity.com. The ministry line for you who you live here in the Phoenix area, 602-636-5800. Remember, we have uh, two live services every week. I speak on Friday nights at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. And uh, Brother Rick and the ministry team are there on Thursday nights for our main deliverance service of the week. Uh, that thing is powerful in the capital P. You don't want to miss that. Thursday nights at 7 o'clock. Please bring somebody who needs deliverance or healing. The anointing is thick. Thick on Thursday nights, to say the least. And on Wednesday night, Brother Rick and the ministry team, we have our Zoom broadcast live at 6 p.m. Mountain Time, 9 p.m. Eastern. And um, you send me an email, mike at hardcorechristianity.com. I'll send you the ID code and the password. Send it, send it right out to you. We had a wonderful year with donations last year. We paid all of our bills on time or early. I paid all my local radio show bills early. Thank you for your donations. When you go to the website, you just hit the PayPal button. That's where most of the donations come in. But if you need a receipt for your donations for 2022, just send me an email and I will ship it right out. Come right out immediately that same day. No problem. Um, I wanted to have share something with you so that in the future, when you're talking to another born again Christian, you can explain to them how Christians can have demons, but cannot be possessed. Christians cannot be possessed by demons, but they can be infected with them. I liken it to the flu or COVID. When you're infected with the flu, you are not the flu, but you're infected with the flu. When the flu's gone, you're fine. And that's how it works in the spirit world. You do not, you are not possessed by a spirit if you're a born again Christian because the demons can't get into the spirit man where the Holy Spirit lives in your spirit man. They can never get in there, but they can get in your body or your brain, causing a physical or mental illness. And so the Bible never says in any passage anywhere that Christians cannot have demons. It does not say that. It's not in the Bible. If you if you look for it, you will not find it. But they can be infected with spirits. And I wanted to share some important information with you today that will help you explain this to Christians who are novices and do not understand the spirit world and do not understand that they themselves are infected with spirits because it's a spirit that told them they can't have a spirit. It's also a spirit that goes around telling people that Christians can be possessed by demons and they cannot be possessed. They cannot be. But if you'll if you take a look at First Timothy chapter three, it's quite remarkable here. <laughs> the standards the Apostle Paul put out there for being a minister in a church. Okay, this applies to any kind of a minister, pastor, associate pastor, on the board, you know, work. They are to be fired. Here it is, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Paul says, quote, this is a true saying. If a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. Now, the Greek word for bishop there is episcope. It's where we get our English word episcopal, like the Episcopal Church. An episcope is somebody who is a supervisor in the house of God. Some kind of supervisor. It could be a pastor, it could be an associate pastor, it could be anything, but they are in a position of knowledge and leadership and supervision 
and that's what an episcopate is. It's translated here as bishop. It's translated as bishop in the King James Bible. But an episcopate is someone who is a leader in your church. And here are the requirements. He itemizes them like an accountant. He says, number one, they must be blameless. Number two, the husband of one wife, one wife, must be vigilant. He must be sober. Uh, some of these things go without saying. I realize that, you know, sober, sober uh, in this verse, believe it or not, does not mean uh, smoking crack or pot or something. Suffering, suffering is the Greek word. It means to have your mind under control. Somebody who's not thinking about crazy things all the time. Somebody who's sober minded is what that means. He must have good behavior. He must be hospitable. He must be a, a natural, <clears throat> a natural teacher. Tadaticus is the Greek word. It means somebody who is just kind of a natural at, in, at teaching, at instructing, at illustrating, at showing people truths and the word of God. Kind of a natural, natural born instructor, so to speak. And then uh, verse three says, not given to much wine. Yeah, okay, uh, that's obvious. No striker. What in the world is a plectus? That's the Greek word for striker there. Somebody that's argumentative or quarrelsome, somebody who likes to debate all the time. That is not a, a person you want to put in any kind of leadership ministry in your church. They always cause hurt feelings and emotional problems among the people. He must not be greedy. He must be patient, right? He must be a, a, not a brawler. Wow. What is, a, what, it is, what is an amicus? A brawler. Yeah, somebody who is nonviolent. He has to be somebody that's not given to duking it out, so to speak. <laughs> Can't be an MMA fighter. And here's the next one, covetous. That goes without saying. As you know, all church scandals are either involving sex or money. So Paul says you cannot be a lover of money or covetous. And, he, and you must be, verse 4, someone that rules their own home well, having their children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man does not know how to rule his own home, how shall he rule? The House of God translation. I had a friend of mine years ago who was an associate pastor of an Assembly of God church. And then he was a great person. He did an excellent job as, a, as an associate pastor. I mean, he was very good. Uh, what was the problem? The problem was that he had a female dominated home. His wife ran everything. And if she didn't get what she wanted, she complained and griped and nagged and so on. And then the two daughters, his two daughters kind of followed after her. They were also kind of emotionally ill. And then the son was also emotionally ill. He had rejection and fear spirits. Later on in life, he became a drug addict and overdosed. But I always wondered when I was younger, I thought, yeah, this guy would make a really good pastor. But this verse kept coming to me. Uh, someone who, who has no rule over their own home. And, uh, you know, he died a few years ago, and he never did get to pastor a church. I mean, he was really a good person and would have done a great job pastoring a church, no question. But he never got it. God never gave him a chance to pastor a church because he had... Problems with his own home. It is terrible. Well, then in verse 6, here's what I wanted to share with you. Verse 6, in the list of qualifications for someone who's a leader in the church, it says he must not be a novice. A neophytus is someone who is a rookie, a young convert, a new convert, something like that. Lest, it says, he be lifted up with 
pride, okay, and he fall into the condemnation of the devil, Diabolus. The Greek word for condemnation here is krima, and that's the word for judgment. And okay? when you when you came to Christ, you received from him mercy. You did not get justice. God gave you grace. He did not give you justice. If he gave you justice, you would have been judged and condemned to an eternity in hell. But you didn't get justice when you came to Jesus. You got mercy. That's what I got, and thank God for that. I did not want justice when I came to God. I wanted mercy. And so um, when people wrong me or stab me in the back, or say bad things about me, whatever it is, happens all the time, I don't pray and ask God to give me justice because I don't want justice. I want mercy. And I pray for the people that turn on me and attack me. Yeah, I pray and ask God to give them mercy. I don't ask him to give me justice and go vindicate me and go wipe these people out and make them pay or anything like that. I don't, I don't even, those thoughts don't even come to my mind because I don't want it done to me. Whatever measure you meet out is the measure that will be given back to you. So if I get stabbed in the back, I'm not going to stab them in the back. I'm going to ask God to forgive them and have mercy, have mercy, because that's what I want. I want God to give me mercy. Mercy is the only neighborhood I can afford to live in. I, I can't pay rent anywhere else. I don't, I don't qualify. I need God's mercy. But here you see, when you come to Christ, you got mercy. You did not get judgment. But do Christians get judged? Crema. Yes, they do. Who judges them? What well, says it right here? A born-again Christian can fall under the judgment of Satan. When you sin, you will reap what you sow. And if you keep on sinning, the judgment of the devil can fall on you. Curses can fall on you. Disasters can fall on you. Sicknesses can fall on you. Pain can fall on you. This is all the judgment of Satan. When a Christian steps outside the covering of the word of God, they're opening themselves up to the crema, the judgment of Satan. The, the devil, Diabolos, as you know, is the false accuser of the brethren. He's always pointing his finger at us and accusing us. And when you activate the blood of Jesus and you confess your sin and you have a humble heart, the blood of Christ removes that sin and there the condemnation of the devil, the judgment, disappears because there's nothing there to judge. Christians who are stubborn and dig in like Alabama ticks, they end up judged, not by God, but by Satan. Now here's verse seven. It says, in addition to this, Paul said, he must have a good report of those who, were, who are without. Exothen. Exothen is the Greek word. It means people who are outside the church not the ones on the inside. He must have a good report or a good testimony. Martyria is the Greek word for report there. It means witness, martyrdom, testimony of people who are outside the church because, Paul says, he could fall into the reproach and the snare of Diablos. The devil. And this is what happens. If you'll notice, everybody who gets involved in a church scandal, it's always involving money or sex. The outside people, the media, the sinners, the people that hate the church, 
always point their finger at them and they reproach them. They reproach them. Anitismus is a Greek word for reproach there. It means to verbally abuse, verbally denigrate. They will verbally trash them. And they will fall into the snare of Diablos, the accuser. The Greek word for snare there is pagis. It means a trap you did not see. You stepped on it and you fell in there. Like in India, when they catch tigers, they dig a big hole, they cover it up. They put some meat or something there, and the tiger walks through and falls into the pit. That's a pagis. And it says here, the devil digs a pit for these people. Then he covers it up like it doesn't appear there. It's a trap. It's a trick. And they fall in, not seeing it coming, a pagis. They don't see it. See that? They don't see what the devil has planted for them. God didn't do it. God is not reproaching them. God is not trapping them. They are trapping themselves because they allowed the devil to judge them. They got involved in some kind of behavior that Satan saw. Satan accused it. Diabolos, who was an accuser of the brethren. And the person didn't change and didn't repent. And so the devil judged them and then reproached them and then caused them to fall into a trap they never saw coming. They never saw it coming. It's a trick. Take a look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, would you? It's really interesting. And uh, Paul is again going over some requirements for ministers. Okay? And he says, verse 22 says, uh, flee youthful lust. Wow, I wish I could have done that when I was young, but I wasn't serving God then. I was partying with as many lusts as I could create myself. It's terrible. Flee youthful lusts and follow righteousness, faith, love, peace with all them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Translation, don't associate. As Rodney Dangerfield used to say, I attract everybody who can do me absolutely no good. Don't hang around people who can influence you negatively, sinfully, wickedly, lustfully, unrighteously. Avoid them. And then he says, verse 23, also avoid foolish and unlearned questions. Can God make a rock so heavy he can't pick it up? Stupid stuff, debating over insane doctrines like evolution, you know, fight over that. Did, did we come from apes? I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Of course we didn't. Evolution is a monumental joke. He says, hey, don't, don't fight over these things. Don't, don't cause strife over them. But a servant of the Lord, it says, verse 24, must not strive. And a makomai is a person who likes to get in debates and argue over Bible verses and theories and doctrines. I'm pre-trip. I'm post-trip. I'm mid-trip. Oh, no, that's not right. That's not right. That one's not right. No, this is right. That's right. That one's right. Stupid. Idiotic. Okay. There's no point in arguing over the rapture. You can't do anything about it. Okay? That's not your job. You're not supposed to be worrying about the rapture. Right? That's what Jesus said to Peter just before he went back to heaven. Hey, listen, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. Okay. Peter goes, what about this guy? Hey, it's, it's not, that guy's none of your business. You just follow me. Okay? And that's how you debate the rapture. You go, who cares? I don't have any control over it anyway. It's none of my business. The rapture occurs whenever it occurs. That's out of my 
the purveyor, my knowledge or my authority. Let's go on to something that actually means something. It says the servant of the Lord must not strive, not mind, but he must be gentle. Apius. What does that mean? He must be, you know, somebody people can get along with. He must be the type of person that people feel comfortable around. People sense they can talk to the person. They sense they kind of care about it. They're listening to them. He must be gentle to all. Apt to teach. Okay, mention that in the first Timothy. We just read that. He must be patient in meekness. Instructing those that oppose themselves. Okay? If you're going to be in the ministry, I hope you will be someday. Uh, you have to meet certain requirements. I read the list in First Timothy. And you must be a person who is who has humbleness about them, meekness about them. Somebody who doesn't want to dominate or lord it over somebody. Okay? This is the reason that uh, you never have, you know, dominant people running a ministry, male or a female. Okay. In particular, uh, alpha females are major problems with ministries. They, they get a lot of things done and they're go-getters and they're great motivators, but they wear on people's nerves. And after a while, you're going to have a pastoral staff that's going to bolt because an alpha female is too authoritative, too aggressive, too goal oriented and doesn't have the meekness, the gentleness and the patience to be an appropriate leader of men and women. Okay? They must be apt to teach patience and meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves if God peradventure will give them repentance to acknowledging the truth. This verse is amazing because it says that repentance is a gift from God. And not everybody receives that gift. And I can testify to that myself over the years, being a counselor. I've been a counselor for over 40 years. I have seen numerous Christians over the years who never got the gift of repentance, that never got rid of their rebellion demons, and never got repented of their stubbornness. And they were they were never repented. They never had any godly sorrow. They were never sorrow they hurt God. They never repented. It was awful. And when you pray for someone, you ask them, you ask your Heavenly Father to give them what? Yeah, the gift of repentance. So they can acknowledge the truth. People that are stubborn, people that are narcissists, people that are domineering, controllers, manipulators, you can speak truth to them, but they never hear it. It never gets into their spirit, man. They don't receive it. And this is what Paul's talking about. If perchance God gives them the gift of repentance so they can acknowledge the truth, and here's the verse I want you to remember, so they may recover themselves out of the pagis, same Greek word used in 1 Timothy, we just read it, the pagis, the trap, the unseen trap. You're walking up, and there you go, into the trap of the diabolos, the devil. For they are taken captive by him at his will. Did you know that some Christians can be taken captive by the devil? And they can do his will. They will serve him. What are these two scriptures that I've read to you? What are they hinting at in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy? that Christians can be infected but not possessed by demons. Demons can get into your body or your brain and cause you to do the will of the devil. They can deceive you in your mind, causing you to serve Satan. 
and fall into a trap that you did not see coming. You did not see it coming. Now turn over to James chapter 3, if you would, with me. James 3. Okay, Go down to uh, verse 14. This is really interesting as well. James is talking about Christians, born-again Christians in this chapter. And he recommends in verse 14, here's what I'm telling you to do with these Christians. One, two, three, four, five. So he itemizes it. And then he says, of these things, put them in remembrance and charge them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit. But it leads to subverting the hearers. Then he says, study to show yourself approved to God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But, he says, shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. And their words will eat like a canker. Gangrena is where we get our English word gangrene, like a cancer. A canker is like cancer. And he mentions two guys who had done that, Hymenius and Philetus. For they erred from the faith, and they were teaching that the resurrection already happened. When in fact, it's obviously not, not already happening. The resurrection of the saints is something in the future, not in the past. And so here you see Christians behaving like they have been infected with spirits. They're thinking like the devil. They're acting like the devil, Diabolos, the accuser. And they're giving him things to accuse them of. They said this. They did that. They're striving. They're causing discord. They don't meet the qualifications for a bishop, an episcopate. They're doing this, to, and he and he accuses them of everything they're doing. He nitpicks them. See, some people had a, grew up with a mother who was a nitpicker, or a dad who was critical, and they grew up with fear and rejection demons and low self-esteem, and then later on they started to reject themselves, self-rejection. You see that. So there is no verse in the Bible that says Christians cannot have demons, but it's insinuated in numerous verses. High illustrated completely by the disciple Peter. Peter was the foghorn of the group. He would have made a fortune as a hostess on a live bait boat. Always running his mouth, a megaphone type person. And a very flawed human being. Peter, Peter was my favorite person because I looked at him and I said, man, if this guy made it. I got a shot at this. I'm like him. I got all kinds of flaws. And I'm screwed up too. So if he made it, hey, I'm, I'm going to make it. I loved Peter. Uh, he was a certified goof. Loved it. Well, before the day of Pentecost, these are disciples, they were infected with demons. I mean, look at Judas. Look at Peter. Here's those two examples. Look at Doubting Thomas. He was narcissistically stubborn and wouldn't believe, even though he had numerous credible eyewitnesses that saw the resurrection of Christ. He said, I'm not going to believe until I stick this thing into this hole in his side, okay? I know he got stabbed by that centurion. I know they rammed a spear up his side. There it went. And until I see that hole, I, I don't believe you guys. You're all lying. He called all the disciples the liar. I go, well, that's a 
common symptom of Christians who are infected with spirits. That they're always pointing their finger at somebody else and nitpicking them, calling them liars. You're not listening to me. You're abusing me. Uh, you don't like me. Uh, but, you know, on and on it goes. Yeah, that was Thomas. You're at fault. I'm not. You're an idiot. I'm not. And Peter literally starts manifesting. Jesus said, I'm going to go to the cross of Calvary. I'm going to have to leave you. I've got to save the world. Peter goes, are you crazy? You're not doing that. And then in the Greek text, it says he actually yanked him aside. He pulled him over. Can you imagine that? And Jesus said to Satan, the demons were speaking out of Peter's mouth. Get thee behind me, Satan. He didn't even mention Peter. You only focus on the things of men, not the things of God. He wasn't calling Peter Satan. Peter was Peter. He wasn't Satan. Far from it. But when a demon speaks out of someone's mouth, and you've seen and heard it before, you're talking to a born-again Christian, something triggers them, triggers them, and suddenly they have like a personality change. I did a Bible study on it. It's called dipsicus, the Greek word for someone that has two souls. A dipsicus in the King James Bible is translated as double mindedness. A dipsicus, somebody who has two souls. And you run into these people, and it's it's kind of scary because they're counting it, they morph into this other person. And it's like you're talking to a totally different person, and it goes quickly. It's like a quick snap. This other personality takes over. That's what happened to Peter. He was a dipsicus. This spirit took over his personality and he started to rebuke God and tell God that God wasn't to complete his plans and do what he wanted to do. Can you imagine that? Well, sure you can. Christians do it all the time. They're always disappointed with the Lord and they don't like his decisions. They tell him what to do. But that's demonic. That came from. The illustration of the disciple Peter. Get thee behind me, Satan. Listen, God's not judging you for your sin. He already judged you at the cross of Calvary. But there is somebody out there judging you for your sin and watching it and accusing you of it and keeping track of it and nitpicking you. Yeah, there's somebody out there. Every single born-again Christian has been assigned by the kingdom of darkness a group of demons that are assigned to destroy you. And when you become a born-again Christian, that assignment is bigger. There is more spirits following you around, trying to discredit you and judge you and nitpick you and accuse you than there were when you were a sinner. When you were a sinner, the devil already had you in the bag. You were already bagged. You were his servant. You did basically what he wanted you to do. You fought the way he wanted you to think, you were a sinner. Sinners sin, sin because they're sinners. That's, that's how it works. Now that you're a born-again Christian, not your born-again Christian, you are to stop sinning, and you are to think like the mind of Christ, and your behavior is to be like your Heavenly Father, and you're to love like Him and be like Him, and demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit, right? The fruit of the Spirit, Galatians. And if you remember this one uh, simple truth, I taught on it Friday night. In the spirit world, spirit beings can enter your body. Demons can enter your body. The Holy Spirit can enter your body. That's two examples. When a spirit being enters your body, that spirit being gives you what they have, and they can only give you what they have. They can't give you anything else. Okay? So if you got infected with a lust spirit, the lust demon has lusts, and he's going to transfer his lusts to you. 
Same thing with a fear spirit. Same thing with a critical spirit. The spirit has certain traits. Fear, fear demons, lust, lust demons, anger, rage and murder, anger spirits. And they transfer those qualities to you once they enter you. The Holy Spirit's the same. Once he comes into your spirit, man, he then transfers what he has, right? The Holy Spirit cannot transfer to you lust, anger, resentment, bitterness, because he doesn't have it to transfer to you. He can't give it to you. There's no way. A spirit that enters your body cannot transfer to you godly love. Godly patience. Why? He doesn't have it. Spirits can only give you what they have. If they don't have it, they can't give it to you. A lust demon only has and can only give you what he has. He cannot give you things that other demons have. So, if you have a lust spirit, he's not going to be able to give you divination powers because he doesn't have them. You know, a familiar spirit has to enter your body and get into your brain like kundalini spirits, like church demons, like mind control spirits, like planet spirits. They get into your brain, they hijack your mind, and they give you religious stuff. Okay, you're not going to get that from a fear spirit or a lust spirit. A spirit being can only give you what they have. They transfer it to you. And the Holy Spirit can only give you what he has. The, the fruit of the spirit, the gifts of the spirit, the anointing, the love of God. He can't give you anything else because he doesn't have it. He doesn't have it. He can't give it to you. He can't give you bitterness. He can't give you anger. He can't. He doesn't have it. The devil is the one judging you. Your heavenly father is not. He is constantly encouraging you to repent, to change, to grow. He never stomps on you when you hit the deck. And I know that from personal experience. I've hit the deck numerous times. <laughs> numerous times. God never came over and said, you know something? You're a chronic failure. You suck. And step on my neck. It never happened. He doesn't need to. The devil's going to do it. God doesn't need to judge you. Crino. He doesn't need to do it. The devil's already doing it. God doesn't nitpick you and point out all of your faults and lament over the fact that you're a failure and a loser and you got problems and you're not listening. He doesn't do that. He doesn't, you know, something funny. Your Heavenly Father never has never even had one bad thought about you. That's all reserved for demons. They have chronic bad thoughts about you. Everything about you makes them sick. They can't stand you. You stink like a skunk to them. And they hate your guts and their job. I guess they get paid somehow. Their job is to get rid of you. And they are highly motivated to do it. And you have been targeted for termination. And they will use any method they possibly can. Their favorite method being your mind. Whoever gets your mind, the spirit being that enters your body, wants your mind. The Holy Spirit enters your body. He goes to your spirit man. He wants, he wants your mind. Demons enter your body. They want your mind. Whoever gets your mind gets the rest of you. Judgment falls on Christians all the time, but not from God. 
God already judged you at Calvary. I was judged for my horrible sins and my pathetic life at Calvary. And I got mercy, not justice. Therefore, since you have freely received, you must freely give. Therefore, I must give mercy to others since that's what I got. Okay? Judge not, Crino, and you will not be judged. Okay? Two Fridays ago, I taught on, on judgment and the differentiation of the Greek words for judgment. I'll go over it here again. Judgment fell on me at Calvary. It's not falling on me now. Mercy is. But a pegis, a trap you do not see, is being formed out ahead of you. If you don't understand that to be a minister, you have to meet the qualifications of a of a bishop, the King James word version, an episcopate, a leader in the church. You have to meet these criteria. If you don't, and you go into the ministry, you didn't go through deliverance, you didn't repent of all your sins, you don't have your family in order, you don't have your house in order. You went into the ministry not ready to go, not properly trained. If you do that, out ahead of you, and you can't see it, is a pegis. It's a trap you do not see. And when you walk over it, you fall in. You know what happens next? Hell comes to breakfast in your house. And you're going to backslide. You're going to slip into depression. You're going to get down on yourself. You're going to think that God is mad at you, that he's turned on you, that he's judging you. God's going to judge this and that and that and this. No, he's not. If God's going to judge, judge America, then he's going to have to start with you. Yeah, because you're Miss Perfect. Right? You're Mr. Wonderful, right? Not. You got mercy from God when you came and fell on your knees. I fell on my face at church years ago when I was begging like a dying man for mercy from God, crying my guts up that God would have mercy on my soul. I wasn't asking for justice. God didn't want justice. I wanted mercy. How about you? <laughs> Pretty neat. If somebody judges you and you're feeling judgment, you're feeling condemned, switch it over to the devil. It's not coming from your heavenly father. No, it's not there. That's a rejection demon talking to you again. Remember, he was talking to you when you were four years old. He's still talking to you. Still talking. To you. You're no good. You're a failure. You're lousy. You're, you're pathetic. You're pitiful. You suck. Hey, trust me. We all get that same script. Okay, demons always use the same thing over and over and over. It's just like another thing to them. They use whatever works. So whatever little phrase of condemnation you respond to, they'll use that over and over again, right? If it's about your physical appearance, they'll use that over and over again. If it's about your heritage, your race, whatever it is, they'll hunt and peck through you to you till they find a soft spot, something that hurts you. And they'll just keep using it over and over again. Why not? They're not stupid like Christians. They find something that works. They keep doing it. You know, they're, they're not dumb. Far from it. But today you're not dumb either. You realize that God has judged you at Calvary. He's not judging you anymore. You realize today that God has never had one bad thought about you. That he is 100% behind you. He wants you to change. He wants you to repent. He wants you to renew your mind. And he will help you literally every step of the way. To you reach a point spiritually where you cannot be stopped and you become a very dangerous person. Very dangerous person. Years ago, the devil should have killed me when he, when he had the chance. He blew it. 
I'll tell you one short story before I close. This, this actually happened to me. I wasn't serving God. I don't understand how everything works in the kingdom of God. I don't have all the answers. But I used to work at a bakery when I was uh, in my early 20s. Uh, Dolly Madison was the name of the company. I think they got bought out by Hostess a few years ago. But anyway, I worked at the plant, uh, Dolly Madison Bakery plant, where they manufactured, you know, the zingers, the the the, uh, the pies, um, the cup, the stuff like that, you know, all the stuff you shouldn't eat. And uh, the supervisor says, hey, uh, listen, I was on the maintenance, midnight maintenance. I work graveyard. And uh, the graveyard shift I liked because it wasn't very busy. And uh, you didn't have to work very hard. If you worked in production during the day, if you worked in shipping during the day, man, those guys worked all day long. It was a union job. You worked two hours, two hours, you got a break. Working in the two, got a break. And that's how they worked it. But on maintenance at, in the middle of the night, uh, it was a very loosely run ship. Well, the supervisor um, knows that I need some time to kill. So he takes me up to the top of the plant. And we had giant vents, like uh, coming down the ceiling in the plant, probably 25 feet in the air. This was a big manufacturing plant. And uh, he wanted me to get down into the vent and clean the crap off the sides of the vent. <laughs> it wasn't going to work, but... I, it was just something to do, you know. And uh, they gave me a bucket. They get I got some kind of a sponge or something. So I climbed down into this vent, you know, and it's about, I'm going to say four foot deep, four foot deep. And it's probably four feet wide, three feet wide, three feet wide, coming down out of the ceiling. And it had a trap door at the bottom of it. And it was about 30 feet in the air at the top of the ceiling of this plant. And so I get down into the vent and I'm standing there cleaning the crap off the walls. And suddenly, literally in a microsecond, the vent below me, the trap door on the vent below me drops. A pegis. And I am now falling to my death. I'm falling out of the vent. And so help me God. Something grabbed my hands, the back of my hands. And my hands went forward. Uh, fast as lightning, and I grabbed the edge of the vent while I was falling to my death. The trap door, boom, Peggy dropped open. Whew. I mean, I'm down. It, this all happened in sections of seconds. My hands, miraculously, something pushed my hands forward. I grabbed the vent rail my feet are dangling out of the 30 feet in the air I'm dangling out of this vent <laughs> and uh, suddenly this incredible strength came over me I pulled myself up of the vent jerked my knee up put my foot on the edge of the lip that I was hanging on miraculously I was falling like a rock my hand, something pushed my hands, and I grabbed the lip on this thing, pulled myself back up, put my foot up, stood back up, and then went down to the supervisor's office because I had clipped to my left knee on that lip on the vent, and it had starting to swell. I thought, oh, I might have blown a knee out, but I didn't even think about that because I would have been dead. 
I, there was no way I could have survived that fall. If I did survive it, I would have probably been permanently disabled the rest of my life or stuck in a wheelchair or something. It was miraculous. I have no idea what happened that day. I don't know what was going on. Somebody saved me. When my hands got this super strength and I caught the edge of that lip and I was dangling out of the top of the plant in the air, hanging out there, <laughs> pulling myself up. I had this incredible strength come over me. And then it left after I got out of the vent. I mean, it was literally amazing. And uh, I think what had happened there was, I don't have all the answers, but I think God in his futuristic mercy uh, saves people providentially sometimes. And it's happened to me several times since I've been a Christian, since I've been following the Lord. And it's happened to you. You could look back over your life and, and tell me, tell me a brother Mike story. Hey, this is exactly what happened to me. I was standing on the corner. Uh, somebody lost control. The car flipped. Uh, something from the building fell over. Uh, unbelievable. I, I should have been killed and I wasn't. You have those stories as well. Do you not? It just happened to me. It just happened to me. Recently, I was in Kansas. And I was holding a healing service there in uh, Emporia, Kansas, at the VFW. This just happened a few weeks ago. And uh, one day, my sister and my oldest daughter decided to go to Kansas City. So we drove up there. We wanted to look around. This was before the Super Bowl. We wanted to see what was going on with the Chiefs and how the town was uh, all set up. We went down to Union Station. The thing was spectacular. And it was one of the most amazing days I've ever had in my entire life. I could not believe the stuff that was happening to me that day. It was utterly amazing. Uh, we were driving down the freeway, and an old man in a pickup with a camper is entering the freeway on ramp here. He gets up near us, does not check to his left, does nothing, and veers right out at us. My daughter swings to the left into the other lane in front of a semi that was to our left. I was in the back seat in the passenger seat on the right side. She swings to the left like Mario Andretti in his prime, swings back and avoids this guy. Literally, was, he was going to sideswipe us. Later on, we're driving down a street to go to a coffee shop in downtown Kansas City. And some teenager left turns in front of us. And it was so fast. It was amazing. My daughter does the same thing again. She miraculously swings the car to the right. And then swings it to the left. And we miss this left turning car. By that much, we miss the parked cars on the right side by that much. And we go on to the uh, coffee shop. We go down to Arrowhead Stadium. And we go in and we went into the sports shop, looked around, came out. And when we entered the parking lot at Arrowhead, there was this gigantic sign, probably in the neighborhood of 15 feet tall by 25 feet wide. It was on stands. It was a sign on stands. I don't even know what the sign said. said. We drove right by the sign. When we were leaving Arrowhead and coming out, the wind picked up, and I heard a crash right behind my head. We were in a Kia. I'm in the back seat on the right. The wind had blown that sign down, and it just missed the back of the car. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Then after that, we went to the World War I Memorial. Okay. And it, it was truly spectacular. If you're ever in Kansas City, definitely recommend you go visit the World War I Memorial. Awesome. Well, as you know, or may know, it's 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 got, you know, it seems like a half a mile of concrete steps up to the giant memorial statue, and then it's way up in 
up looking over the city of Kansas City and you can stand there and see downtown Kansas City. It's probably 300 feet in the air or something like that. Well, I'm looking around at the the, uh, monument and and the facility and everything while we're leaving the place. I step down and I miss the step. And at my age, okay, a fall is about the worst thing you get involved in. When you get, when you're an older person, falling is usually the next step to the end. That usually puts you on your slide to your grave. I would have fallen down. I don't know how many flights of concrete steps. I would have been either dead or busted up like you can't even believe. As I'm starting to fall, I felt something steady me. I I can't explain it. And suddenly, I found both my feet right on the step, steady. And I stopped tumbling forward. You just recently in Kansas City. Okay. So I was either going to be severely mauled, maimed, or killed four times in one day. Four times in one day. Okay. And that that was a sign to me that I'm supposed to continue my podcast on Sunday morning. That was a sign to me that God is a God of mercy and grace, and that I get grace and mercy even though I don't deserve it. And that was a sign to me that what I have taught you today from God's word is 100% true. He has never had a bad thought about you. He has saved you from dying numerous times over the years. He just did it for me. He did it when I was, you know, in my early 20s. I think I was 20 years old when I should have fallen out of that vent at Dolly Madison Bakery. I didn't fall Somebody grabbed my hands and pulled me out of there. It was was amazing. It was miraculous. And that's what you are. You're still here today. You are amazing. You've been hit with everything the devil's got. You've been hit from every side you could possibly get hit from. And you're still standing. And you are going to fulfill your destiny. You are not going to die wasting your life like everybody else does. It's not going to happen. You're not going to die as a born-again Christian, wasting your life like all the other born-again Christians do. 99-some percent of born-again Christians are spiritual losers, and they waste their lives getting caught up in the things of this world and the lusts of other things. And on and on it goes, just like Jesus said. But you are not going to do that. You're on this podcast because you don't want to do it. You like the deep things of God. And that's exactly what's going to happen to you. The devil's going to be sorry. Sorry he ever showed up at your house for breakfast with hell. He's going to regret it. You know what he's going to say when you're done? I should have left that one alone.